Now, okay. uh, when, when we talk about the testicular torsion, the twist coding system is very important. This is routinely okay. being used in NHS. And what happens is we uh, risk stratify. This is very sensitive. If we find that the twist score is five or seven, this becomes a really a high risk for a testicular torsion. You can counsel the parents that these patients are going to, are most likely to have torsion. If the twist code is less likely, less, then you start thinking about reevaluating the history, considering a Doppler ultrasound and reconsidering your decision to explore. Okay. okay. But if the twist score okay. is very high, five or seven, then you straightforward, you can counsel for exploration. Why the role of Doppler ultrasound is not that much established in a testicular torsion, in spite of being a so specific, in spite of being so sensitive, 60 to 100 percent sensitivity. But the problem is even a testicular torsion, one on four patients, you can miss the testicular torsion in a Doppler ultrasound because of the increased vascularity because of normal vascularity. So if we are going to miss one or four patients, there is no point in getting an ultrasound routinely in all the patients. But if your theater is not immediately available, if you are have to wait anyway, then you can get a Doppler ultrasound. That is how you can justify in your uh, to the examiner. That's not your routine practice, but if the theater is delayed by an hour or if you have to wait for half an hour, you can definitely, and the radiology facility is immediately available, you can get a Doppler ultrasound, but this is not going to change your management if your twist score or if your clinical suspicion is very likely of a testicular torsion. Then the consent, the salvage rates, or the other way, the orchidectomy rate has to be documented, including the time of onset and the duration of the uh, symptom. That has to be documented. Okay, and the bilateral orchidopexy, if you find a torsion, you might require a bilateral orchidopexy. And you must explain about the complications. I think you mentioned about most of the complications, like palpable sutures or chitis atrophy. Try to bring about the rates. This is a delayed atrophy rate. In a long term, when you follow the child for 10 to 20 years, you might find that 50% might undergo atrophy. Subfertility is common in 30 to 40%. Spermatogenesis might be decreased in 50%. And some patients might even undergo retorsion, especially if you're using a delayed absorbable or an absorbable suture, they're likely to undergo retorsion. Okay. Regarding okay. the salvage rate, uh, you mentioned this one correctly. The It is more than 24 hours. It is less than 10%. If it is within six hours, the salvage rate is more than 90%. There is no confusion in that. And if it is 10 to 12 hours, it is around 50%. Okay, so okay. just remember these three data because you can just, uh, um, uh, uh, if you find that the uh, question is in eight hours or 10 hours, then you can modify your answer accordingly. But this is how what you have to remember grossly to counsel the patient okay. and the parents. Now, steps of exploration is, uh, so even the BOSS guidelines, they recommend that the preferred incision is always a median raphe midline craniocaudal incision. So that is the preferred incision. Uh, so you deliver the affected side first. Okay, so what are the things you are going to inspect for? Three things, okay? It's not your target, it's not just to look for presence of a torsion or not. One more thing I forgot to mention, if I go back, degree of twisting you mentioned about. So the salvage rate not only depends on the duration, it also depends on the degree of twisting. So if you find a 360 degree uh, twisting, six hours, it might not have a 90 degree, 90% 90 salvage rate. If you find 180 degree for 12 hours, it might have a better salvage rate. So degree of twisting is also important. So it's not just torsion that you are going to look for. You are going to look for presence of bell clapper deformity or not, presence of any other pathology or not. Any other pathology, it can be an epidermal architis, appendage torsion, or uh, any, any other uh, uh, thing like a hernia or something. So if you find any other pathology, you need to look for that also. Before we move to the management, let us understand bell clapper deformity first. So uh, if you look at this, bell, this is the normal side and this is the bell clapper deformity. So what happens in a bell clapper deformity is what the examiner is expecting us to say is a tunica vaginalis. This is the purple color is the tunica vaginalis. Normally the tunica vaginalis should attach to the other two ends of the epididymis and should be tightly uh, keeping the testes in position. However, in a bell clapper deformity, the tunica vaginalis, there is high attachment of the tunica vaginalis and uh, on the spermatic cord. Okay, so the testes is 
So it is not attached to the uh, epididymis, number one. Since it, it, it forms a mesentery-like uh, pedicle on which the testis can rotate now. The first problem is this. The second problem is the testis starts to lie on a horizontal axis. So if the testis is lying on a horizontal axis with a mesentery-like structure due to the attachment of the uh, tunica vaginalis on the high on the spermatic cord, there is a high likelihood of a testicular torsion. So the components of a dual clapper deformity includes, number one is a high attachment of the tunica vaginalis. Number two is a horizontal lie of the testis. Number three is a high lying testis. So all these three points together form the bell clapper deformity. So when you are exploding the testis, so you are going to mention about the, you are going to look at the lie of the testis first and whether the uh, testis, uh, whether the tunica appears to be highly attached and whether the uh, testis is uh, lying horizontally and high. So all these points will determine whether the bell clapper deformity is present. Now if we go back to the exploration, these are the three scenarios that that uh, you are going to be uh, given any of them. So the first scenario that you can see is that whether the torsion is confirmed or not. So if you can confirm on exploration that there is a torsion present, in that case, uh, you see first thing whether the testis is viable or not. So if the testis is viable, untwist it, fix the uh, torsion on that, fix the testis on that side, explore the contralateral side and just uh, fix the opposite side also. This is the easiest scenario that you might get. But this is not so easy. Suppose the test is ischemic and uh, you mentioned about applying warm gauze over it and put, giving the uh, asking the anesthetist to give 100% oxygen, waiting for 5 minutes and 10 minutes. So in that, you mentioned everything correctly. No problem in that at all. The only thing is by the time you are waiting for 5 to 10 minutes, Go and explore and fix the contralateral testes. Don't just wait for five and 10 minutes, okay? So that is what uh, the guidelines mention. So you're not just going to wait for five and 10 minutes. Explore and fix the contralateral testes by the time you are putting the warm gauze over there. And then you come back to reinspect the affected side. So you have saved 10 minutes of anesthesia for that patient. Now, during the reinspection, you might find the testes is viable. Go for fixation. If you find the testis is unviable, go for orchidectomy. The problem is when you find this uncertainty. Okay, when you find there is an uncertainty, you mentioned that we go for stab incision on the tunica albuginea. If we make a stab incision, there is fresh bleeding. You find that, okay, the testis is salvageable. You can keep the testis. But still, after stab incision, that is the question. If you still find that there is uncertainty, there is still always a possibility so in that case, always better to keep an uncertain test is rather than removing an uncertain test is as per the guidelines. Okay. Okay. You always keep the uncertain test is. You don't remove an uncertain test is. There is not going to be any problem. If you keep an uncertain viable test is, you can do a delayed orchidectomy anytime. But if you are uncertain, don't do an immediate orchidectomy. Okay. Now, this was the first scenario where you confirmed, okay, there was a torsion. But the second scenario where you explore, you don't find any torsion, okay? And you don't find any orchitis, you don't find any uh, tumor, you don't find any uh, uh, any other pathology, okay? Hernia or something. So in that case, you look whether the bell clapper deformity is present or not. So if there is no bell clapper deformity at all, okay? You just close it, come out, finish it, okay? You don't have to explore the opposite side. But if you find that there is a bell clapper deformity on this side, on the explored side, you do an orchidopexy on this side, okay? Then you go okay. for exploration of the opposite side. Now, if the opposite side also, if there is a bell clapper deformity, then only you repair it. Otherwise, don't do an orchidopexy on the opposite side. But you need to explore the opposite side if there is bell clapper on one side.